Well, again, a warm welcome to each of you and a special welcome to our guests and newcomers today. We hope that you'll stay afterwards for Coffee Fellowship today as we uh, enjoy sacred community together in Christ. Amen? Amen. Today we conclude uh, our series, Revival, and over these last two weeks, uh, we've listened to passages in which people have experienced restoration and renewal. Last week we had many prayer stations talking about how prayer leads us to restore our lives, and we talked from the book of Ephesians about the saving power of God's grace through faith in Christ, and we renewed our faith and recommitted ourselves as followers of Jesus in, the, in a beautiful service of prayer and reflection. Today we come uh, to talk about the, the issues of forgiveness and healing, and sometimes they're separate. Sometimes healing is about physical and emotional and spiritual healing, and sometimes forgiveness is about forgiving those who have hurt us or seeking the forgiveness of others. So I say to you again and again that forgiveness does not mean forgetting, and forgiveness certainly doesn't mean that we stay in harmful or abusive relationships. Amen? But sometimes forgiveness and healing are connected. Sometimes our inability, my inability to forgive, begins to wear on me physically and emotionally. Amen? It hangs on and it, 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 it challenges me. And so sometimes in our lives, forgiveness and healing may be intertwined. Today we encounter a, a powerful story of someone restored and renewed and then in turn how they were able to offer extravagant and lavish love. May we be open to healing. May we be open to those places where we need forgiveness. Maybe we're already thinking of someone we may begin to forgive, and maybe all of that's connected together for us. Amen? Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for revival. We pray and give thanks for the Holy Spirit, holy fire that comes into our hearts. As we heard Randy sing, sometimes our hearts are cold and brittle. Sometimes we're, we feel a dimness about our faith, and we long to be renewed and revived. And we pray for the oil of gladness to heal us and the wine of salvation to restore us and that your word will remind us that we are your beloved and we are worthy, worthy of your grace. So now, God, help us set aside the busyness of the day, the tension of driving in a storm, the things we have left before us, the changes in our lives that are before us this week. And in this moment, may we open ourselves deeply to what you would say to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I don't know about you, but um, sometimes when I, I'm in a gathering or, or so forth, I, it really bugs me when people don't see me, right? I mean, have you ever been in a place or someone and you think people see you and they don't see you? You know what I'm saying? So for example, a good friend of mine was here last summer and a, a mutual friend of ours uh, through a party to welcome him back from Europe and that he was going to be here for a few days. And we all got there early to be a part of that dinner. And, you know, I don't know if you ever think, you think you're that person's very best friend, anybody, right? And so I just had imagined the whole way of driving into Chicago that when he walked in, he would go, oh, James, it's so great to see you, right? But as soon as he came through the door, he immediately went to my friend Chris. I was like, what's up? And then he went to several other people and I kind of felt like maybe I was invisible, right? Finally, after I think he greeted 120 people, right, he greeted me, James, good to see you. But I didn't think he saw me. And though it's kind of silly, sometimes we've been in places where we have hoped to have been seen, recognized, attended to, but we haven't. And then I think about times when I haven't seen things, you know, or haven't seen people. You know, I, I, I just... Recently, my good friend Daniel was here, and he wanted to go to, into Wisconsin, and so we went in Wisconsin, did a little driving tour of the southern end of the state, and we were in a small Wisconsin town uh, having a dinner or lunch, and as we walked in, I just walked in and took my seat, and you know, we began to order, and a woman came up to the table and said, Pastor James, and in my head, I was like, I have no idea who you are, <laughs> but I'm pretty good at this. I said, oh, how are you, Right? And I said, how's your family? And, sh and she answered back and forth. And then she's a wise person. She said, you have no idea who I am, right? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, sister. I am so sorry. I do not. 
And she introduced herself, and she said, I'm so-and-so, and I used to be a part of your church in Rockford, and we've moved, and I can't believe you're here, and we made these kind of connections. And she said, but you know, I was sitting right by the front door, and, and you walked in, and you didn't see me. And I thought, I didn't see her. I didn't see her. Today's passage is about being seen in some ways. It's a profound story that comes from Luke. There are similar stories in Matthew and Mark and John, but they're not the same story. This is unique to Luke alone. It echoes some of those other stories, but it's an interesting story. It's set in Galilee. It's after a healing and a raising from the dead, a conversation with John the Baptist's disciples, and some deep and abiding teaching and calling. And it's here Jesus finds himself in uh, the area of Galilee, in the home of a Pharisee. Now, a couple of things we need to know up front are that Pharisees are religious leaders, right? There were scribes, there were Sadducees, and there were Pharisees. Pharisees were legal experts. They kept the law. They tended the law. Uh, they loved the law. They, they, they really lifted and taught the Torah frequently, and so that was their passion. And they were key leaders in, in this per- particular period in Judaism. And Jesus would have had relationships with Pharisees. We know that he did. And he must have to be invited to, to a meal in this house. At first, we have no idea who this person is, but we have a sense that Jesus has been invited. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to chapter 7 and follow along with me as we hear this amazing story. So Jesus is invited to a house for dinner with a Pharisee, and he took his place at the table. Now, we tend to think of tables and chairs, right? That's how we eat dinner together. But in the ancient world, the table was lower, often in the shape of a U. Uh, the lead person would be at the end of the U, and you would, uh, the, the more important people would sit. We don't know where Jesus is in this, but you would kind of recline to eat, right? So you would not be sit- seated in a chair. You would recline, and your feet would be toward the back. And uh, so you'd, I'd, I'd love to show you, but I don't think I can get up. But anyway, it's kind of like this, right? You see what I'm saying? And so they're reclined at the table, Jesus has taken his place, the meal has begun, and a woman of the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in this Pharisee's house, came in. Now, a woman in the city or a woman of the city, you can begin to realize that this language implies that something's up, amen? And in fact, it is most likely that this woman of the city is a prostitute. And uh, so she has come in, and, and we're all like, how did she get in, Right? But the homes of the ancient world didn't have closed doors necessarily, and certainly there were servants in and out, and maybe this Pharisee had a number of them, and no one really thought anything of it. But the woman enters off the street, and she stands behind Jesus. And she could do that because of the way he was reclining, his feet behind him. And she stood over his feet, and she began to weep. She didn't cry a little bit. She didn't have a few tears in her eyes. The word is clear. She is weeping profoundly. And as she weeps, she begins to bathe Jesus' feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continues to kiss Jesus' feet, and she anoints them with this oil, this ointment. And this is not just any oil. It's a perfumed oil, and it's in an alabaster container. So she has spent what resources she has to offer this lavish gift to Jesus. Now, you can imagine... All the other dinner guests are kind of in awe, probably just staring, wondering what's happening here. Because I don't know about you, when I have dinner with my family or have folks for over for dinner, people don't come and weep over my feet. Amen? Right? So the Pharisee, the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw it, and he says in his head, I know you never do this, but some people do, if he were a prophet... He would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. So the Pharisee moves into a place of judgment. Amen? But Jesus is a prophet, and he is the Son of God, and he knows what this Pharisee is saying. So he says to him, Simon, he calls him by name. And so now we know the name of the Pharisee. And we know in some way for him to call him by his first name that they have some relationship. This is not a stranger who's invited Jesus over to trap him in some sort of religious conversation. Amen? This is somebody who's been wrestling with who this Jesus is and has some relationship with him. And he's invited his friends and maybe other Pharisees and other religious leaders to this meal. And Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon says, Rabbi, or teacher, speak. 
So Jesus tells a little story, which he often does. There was a certain creditor at Discover who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, which means nothing to us, but that's day wages for 500 people. Do you hear me? Hello, 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 right? It's a lot of money, right? And the other had 50 denarii, which means 50 days of wages. And when they could not pay Discover for this enormous amount of money, the creditor canceled the debts for both of them. I wish Capital One was the same kind of place, right? (laughs) Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus says, you have judged rightly. Then Jesus does an interesting thing. He turns toward the woman who's behind him. He sees her. But he says to Simon, do you see this woman? I want you to hear that again. Do you see this woman? Do you see her? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. That was a common act of hospitality in the ancient world. But she's bathed my feet with her tears, and she's dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. In the ancient world, when people came to your home, you gave them a kiss. But from the time I came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. And you did not anoint my head with oil, a common ancient practice of hospitality. But this woman has anointed me and has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. What an amazing moment. And some scholars believe that this woman would not have entered as a stranger, but that she probably had already encountered Jesus, and Jesus had already restored her and renewed her. And when she found out he was in the neighborhood at this Pharisee's house, she offered this act of great love. In fact, Jesus acknowledges how much her love, how profound, how vast and amazing it is because she has been seen. Do you see her? Do you see her? But then the religious authorities do what sometimes happens in the church. Those who were at the table with him begin to say among themselves, who is this who forgives sins? They already began to criticize and not see the miracle. But Jesus sees the woman. He turns to her and he says, sister, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your great act of love is a sign of your restoration renewal. Go in peace. I love this story, right? I love this story because it says a lot about do we see people or are we seen? It's a beautiful story of someone who probably in their own life thought there was no way they could be revived or restored, let alone forgiven and renewed, but they were. And because they experienced this lavish and amazing and profound gift of grace, she responds in the middle of a public event which could have brought her so much criticism. She responds not with a thank you, not with a quick email, not with a little text. She spends what resources she has to offer this beautiful gift of the oil that changes hearts, and she offers that as a gift to Jesus. I love this story, but it's a convicting story. Do you see her? Do you see him? Do you see them? Do they see you? Are you being seen? Several years ago, I was serving in the final couple of years at the church in Rockford. Our neighborhood had changed quite a bit because of the gentrification downtown, because you know when One area of the city gentrifies, people get moved somewhere else. Do you know that? Amen, right? So the gentrification in downtown Rockford had moved some of our social challenges into our neighborhood, and so suddenly we were dealing with drug deals in the church parking lot and prostitution on the street. Everything changed differently, and we began as leaders of the church to discern what we might do. Our Our initial response is to hunker down and be tough, but that wasn't changing things, right? And so we began to think about how can we be in ministry with and for folks, right? Would we see them, right? 
One summer day, it's, it's a bizarre and funny story and sad nonetheless, I'm in the east parking lot of the church. I've just pulled in in my car. It's a hot day. I've rolled down the window because I'm on the cell phone. This is when you could hold your cell phone and drive. I know you don't do that anymore, and I advise you not, right? I'm in the parking lot on my little flip phone. For those of you who don't know, that's what cell phones used to look like, right? If you still have one, well, all right. I'm on my flip phone cell phone with my mother, and she's kind of talking about a bunch of stuff. When suddenly I see a woman come off the sidewalk into the parking lot, and she's a woman of the city. And I have seen her before, I think, but I don't know. I don't know if I've seen her. But she begins to walk to the car, and she comes close to the car, and I'm on the phone with my mother, and she leans in somewhat into the window, and she says, are you looking? Yes, that's what she meant, if you didn't know. Are you looking? My mother hears it and says, who's there? I said, oh, Mom, it's a woman in the neighborhood. She's just asking me a question. Well, she said, are you looking? What are you looking for? And she said, are you looking, buddy? Because I'm here for action. Yeah. So I heard my mother go, what's going on, right? I said, Mom, just a minute. I said, friend, I do that, you know. Friend, I just want you to know... Um, I'm on the phone with my mom, and I'm also the pastor of this church, right? And suddenly, something shifted. Oh, pastor, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. And then I hear my mother going, is that who I think it is, right? I finally said, Mom, it'll be okay. I put the phone down. I could hear her speaking into the cushion of the chair, right? And I said, it's okay. It's just This ain't going to happen, right? And then I thought I should go back to the phone with my mom, but she just stood there. Did I see her? So my mom's still yelling, and I just click her off. I'm still paying for that, amen, right? (laughs) I get out of the car, and I introduce myself. And she introduces herself. And we just begin to talk. She's deeply embarrassed. She's amazingly remorseful, and she's amazingly broken. She's a single mom trying to make ends meet. It's a terrible situation. We just have a long conversation in the heat in the east parking lot of Brook Road Church. Eventually, she says she needs to be on her way, and I just say to her, if you ever need anything or if there's any way we can help, let us know. And I'll tell you, over that next year, Occasionally, she would drop in for a conversation, occasionally for a drink of water, and we would talk about what she was facing, and we would, we would talk about possibilities, and I wish I could tell you it all came together, and she became the church council chair, but that didn't happen. But we built a relationship, and the last time I saw her, before I moved, she dropped in quickly, and I told her I was moving, and she said, I hate to see you go because you know me, because you've seen me. And we prayed together, and she left. I think about her all the time. I think about lots of people who are not seen. I think about people who carry hard realities and brokenness in their lives, who are in desperate need of forgiveness, and who long to be seen. Amen? And then I think about our own lives, right? Our own desire to be seen and known and restored and replenished. I know that there's some of us in the room where everything is coming together. Amen, right? But there's some of us in this room who carry hard realities, right? Some of us carry secrets. Some of us carry addiction. Some of us carry broken relationships. Some of us carry families that are not what everyone thinks they are. Amen? But Jesus sees us. Jesus sees us. Do you believe that? Jesus sees us. And he longs for us to be restored and renewed, healed and forgiven. And then he calls you and me to see others, right? Do you see them? Will you be the church? I love that one commentary said about this passage, This passage 
screams the need for the church. Do you hear that? This passage screams the need for the church that indeed we as followers of Jesus will see those in need and offer love upon love upon love. Do you see her? He sees you. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able. As you go forth from this place into this world, know that you are seen. Amen? Amen. Seen by a Savior who loves you and restores you and forgives you and heals you. Know you are seen. And as you go forth from this place, open your eyes and see others. And offer that hope and grace and healing in all that you do. You are seen. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.